Welcome to our movie on the vertical bandsaw. We're going to cover several interesting things here, starting with what's the difference between a vertical and a horizontal bandsaw? Well, I know the orientation for one, but a vertical bandsaw is generally used for smaller, finer work, whereas the horizontal bandsaw is used for bigger, heavier stock. Uh, the horizontal bandsaw is only used for doing straight cuts. The vertical bandsaw, the, the blade is uh, less wide and can be used for not only straight cuts, but could be used for contour cuts as well. We're going to review the three teeth rule again, both for rectangular stock and cylindrical stock. We'll take a look at all the machine components, including the ones that you should never touch. Uh, we'll cover how to set the blade height so that you get maximum rigidity in the blade and also make it so that it's safer for you. We'll do some examples of cutting rectangular stock and the features that are important to follow or the, the, you know, the uh, procedures that, are, that you should follow. And then we'll do the same thing for cutting cylindrical stock. Welcome today to the Applied Technology Center. Myself, John Waddick, along with master toolmaker, Don Howard. Don, we're coming to a new machine. Uh, previously, we've used what was called the horizontal bandsaw. This is known as what? A vertical bandsaw. Okay, because that's where the blade is oriented. Why would we use this bandsaw and not the other one? Say I got some scroll cutting, or I got a odd part I need to cut. Um, or I might have to just cut a small sliver. I got to cut a section out of a part. Would you say that the other machine is like if you have like a big thing to cut versus this would be something that's less intensive? Yes, that would be for more rough cutting. Um, I can put small stuff in here, but you notice the coarseness of the blade. And we'll show you over here. We got a little bit finer blade, and we still don't. It's still too fine for the material we may choose. Oh. Okay. In this next segment, Don's going to review the three teeth rule, both for rectangular stock and for cylindrical stock. Okay, let's get into that um, while, we're, while we're talking about it. The idea of, of how many teeth, you said over there you should have three teeth engaged in the cut. Yes, a minimum of three teeth engaged in the cut to help support it. What happens is there is a pitch in the teeth, and that's the distance from tooth to tooth. And that distance sometimes can vary depending on how many teeth per inch you have. So what happens if you don't have enough teeth supporting it, your material can actually slip in between, and then what will happen is you start stripping off teeth one at a time. And every time you strip off one tooth, you strip off another tooth, and now you have a bigger gap, and you ruin your blade. So you could lose a lot of teeth. Yes, and Lord knows I need my teeth. Isn't that kind of like one of your previous girlfriends, Don? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, guys. All right, let's show some materials that Too many th that, worms. <laughs> that that have the tr the three teeth requirement and a piece of material that doesn't. Okay. okay. And you can bring all those over here, Don. All right. So which one do you want to start with, Don? This this is. This, what, what would you say that is, eighth inch piece of material? Eighth inch piece of material. I didn't count how many teeth per inch we have here on this blade, but as you can take a look at it, uh, you can see I only have two teeth at any given time being in, engaged in this part. And if I was to move this blade a little bit, I might only have one at any given time. So that would allow my material to slip in here deeper. I'd have a deeper depth of cut, allowing me to rip off or break off a tooth. All right. So this eighth inch piece of material would not be suitable for this blade. If someone wanted to make a cut with a vertical bandsaw on an eighth inch piece of material, what would they have to do? Change the blade to a finer pitch. Okay. Uh, and we're, your and Engineering 153 students are not going to do that. They should call their instructor over if they have a, a situation like this. Right. Absolutely. Okay. All right, Don, here's a piece that looks like it might qualify. What would you say the thickness of this part is? Well, looking at this part, it looks like it's about three-eighths of an inch. Wow, you're, you're pretty smart there, Don. So you know, no, I'm carrying my trusty six-inch scale. Okay. All right, Don, let's go in there. Um, about how many teeth are, are en engaging here? Well, when we take a look at it, we can come up here and we can count it very carefully. you got one, two, three, four, and that's about it. All right. Four teeth engaged. So four, th four is good enough, as long as you have three. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so this part, only two teeth, no good. We're not going to cut this. This part is good. We can cut it. 
What about round stock, Don? We do have a piece of round stock, and eventually, as you, if we were to start cutting here, obviously as a tangent point, we won't have uh, three teeth in contact. But as we enter into the part, we will. All right. So um, let's, would, let's show that on the blade, okay? As you come in on a tangent. On a tangent, you may only have one tooth connecting. But as you engage into this part, which are going to have a nice slow feed like we did over on the horizontal bandsaw, we held on to the head and we eased it into the part until we got more teeth engaged. Same thing we're going to do here is we'll ease this, this material into the blade until it starts cutting, and then we can put a little more cutting force behind it. All right, so just to review back with the horizontal bandsaw, when you were started the cut and coming in on a corner, you only had maybe one tooth, and you didn't go at the full feed rate. You right. held it with your hand. And the same thing is true here, Don, right? You're not going to push it in as fast. Right. Okay. Uh, Let's review the ideas behind the uh, three teeth rules, both for rectangular and cylindrical stock. The overall, <coughs> excuse me, the overriding principle is that you have to have a minimum of three teeth from the saw blade engaged in the part while cutting. If you have less than three teeth, you're most likely going to break teeth off. So here on the left is an example of a part that's too narrow. You can see that the gray part here only is touching maybe one or two teeth. This is not sufficient for proper uh, cutting. The part on the right, being much thicker, you can see that we have the, the criteria of three teeth involved. If you had to cut something that was narrow, like on the left, Don said that we'd have to change the saw blade, one that had a lot finer teeth, so that we did indeed have three teeth engaged. Now, for round stock, uh, the thing to remember is when you start a cut, because of the tangency here, it's going to be impossible uh, to get three teeth engaged. So to compensate for that, you feed the blade into the part very slowly at the start. Now once you have the cut engaged and your blade is in the center of, or toward the, moving toward the center of the part, then you can go to a full feed rate. We're going to look at machine components next. And this is the vertical bandsaw, as we see right here. All right, Don, before we get into any cutting, we should be familiar with the machine and then how to set your part up. So could you just give us a rundown? There's lots of knobs and things, so uh, what should we be aware of here? All right, I'm going to start out with the main controls. The first one is the E-stop here. Again, it's a depression. Once you depress this one, though, in order to release it, to get your power, you have to rotate it clockwise. Once you rotate it clockwise, we see we all of a sudden is have this LED up here flashing at you. All right, we've energized it. So as soon as your e-stop is released, we have energized the machine. All right, so up here, this tells us our feet per minute. That's how fast the blade is moving at any given time. And right now it's flashing zero. There's no movement. The next thing down is we have this little grinder because a tab below that is a welding machine. Welding, so we could use to break blades and weld them together. Um, that practice is getting out of uh, use now. So you don't get to use this very often anymore. Would you say Engineering 153 student, no touch, no touch, no touch? No touch, absolutely. Engineering students will not have to worry about this. Okay. All right. All righty, so that was E-stop, which remember stands for emergency stop. All else fails, you just hit that. Correct. All right, now we go over here. This turns on the grinder we just spoke about. This turns on your work lamp. All right, this is your main power. All right, if I depress this button, now my belt, my band starts rotating, and it's telling me how fast I'm going. So 91 feet per minute, that blade is going past a single point. Is that adjustable, or do, will the instructor have that adjusted for the student? That is adjustable, but you won't have to worry about it. Chances are the instructor has already preset it up for, uh, unless someone's tampered with it. But in order to adjust it, it's this variable speed belt, just like in your uh, the vertical milling machine. The same thing here, you have to rotate this handle and it increases or decreases your spindle speed. And you have to have the machine running in order to do that. Right. All right, the green button, how do I, can I turn it off? I just push in the green button or should I just hit the E-stop? Hit the E-stop. That's how you do it. Yeah. All right. If I hit the green button, nothing happens. Okay. All right, E-stop depresses, kills all the power.
but it's not a quick break. So once you close it, there's still going to be some momentum on that still blade. Momentum on the blade, yes. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Don, Don has a little item on the side. This is a shear, and it's for cutting the blades. So you don't, it's going to cut sheet metal. You don't want to put your finger up here and pull on the lever. All right. So it's a safety issue. Do not mess with this either. That is not a toy. Do not even put your hands near nothing, okay? Engineering 153 student goes near here, you're going to be reprimanded, not only by your instructor, but by myself. Let's review the parts that Don identified and what they're used for. Well, first off, there's the blade. Very sharp, moves very fast, very dangerous. That's a place uh, in this area, this would be our zone of danger. So you're to keep your hands out. You don't want to reach for parts after they're caught until this blade is completely off. You've got a work lamp so that you can illuminate and see what you're doing better. And then over on the left side, we've got some things that you should never touch. The blade shear, the grinder, and the welder. You're saying, what are those doing on the machine? Well, Don said that it used to be a common practice that machinists would be uh, cutting and re-welding um, their, their bandsaw blades right here on the machine. Uh, and he mentioned that that's really not used so much anymore. Down here uh, is the control panel. That's something that you do need to know about. We're going to look at that in more detail in uh, the next uh, section. And then we have the speed adjuster. Uh, this is only to be turned when the machine is on. That's like the vertical mill. Uh, if you turn it when it's not on, you're going to mess up the pulleys. When you turn the machine back on after doing that, you're going to have problems. So speed adjuster should only be turned while this machine is on. Um, but in most cases, Engineering 153 students should not touch this without consulting with their instructor first. Here we have the control panel. Moving from left to right, here on the left we have the grinder, so that would be in the off position and the, the blue line is in the on position, but you're not ever to be turning on the grinder. There's no occasion where an engineering student will be using a grinder on here. The lamp you probably will be using, that can be turned on to the, the one position uh, to illuminate your part. Then you've got the power button that would turn things on. But the power button is only going to work if the e-stop is disengaged. Now, to stop the machine, you push the e-stop in. And when you push it in, it's going to stick in. And when it's stuck in, the power button is disengaged and you can't, it, it will not start the machine. The only way to disengage this is to turn the, uh, the e-stop and then it will pop out. So this is our control panel. You're to use the, the right three buttons. You're never to touch the grinder. Next, we're going to look at setting a blade height. All right. So, Donnie, uh, what are we going to do now? All right. We're going to get ready to cut a piece of material. I've already laid this out with my trusty six-inch scale. I scaled over an inch, and I gave myself a little extra material, just like we did on the uh, horizontal. And I laid out this line with that trusty magic marker you're going to have. So the handy tools that you're going to have right in your person you're going to have with you all the time to be able to do layout, simple layout like this. All right, and don't forget you'll have these things well past the end of the course, so these are lifetime materials until at least your magic marker gets dried out. All right, Donnie, what are you looking at here with the blade? Uh, it seems kind of like there's a lot of blade to do the cut. That's right. Now what we want to do is we want to move our guide down. This is our saw guide. Our saw guides should be in place. And this is, here again, these are things that the engineering students are not going to have to worry about. We're already engaged. We have a width of blade. We have these saw guides right here that are guide the blade. They're already going to be pre-adjusted and set in place. The only thing you may have to worry about is the height. So you're going to want to bring this down to a, a workable height, all right, so that you can see your workpiece, okay? You want to bring it down, it helps rigidity of the blade. Is there some rough estimate of how much you should bring it down? Yeah, within an inch of your work. Uh, in some cases, you may have to leave it up higher because you can't, you, uh, you can't get to the part because there's an obstruction. So if I start using this and I get up in here and I may not be able to see my workpiece, I may want to raise it up. So uh, I would say no more than four times as a rule of thumb. Wow. So this part was, it's hard to do the math. It's 3 eighths times 4. That's 12 eighths, Don. 
one and a half inches yep. above the surface. Approximately. Yep. All right. Does your trusty rule salt tell us that? I'm about an inch and a quarter. Okay. So you're you're within. Okay. All right. Can you just review how this moves up and down again? And I don't know, Jason, could you see there was there a knob? I have a little knob over here that I can grab a hold of. All right. That I can support with my hand. And then there's a handle right out here. All right, like a little thumb screw. I loosen it up, and then I can able to raise and lower this saw guide. All right. Okay. Thank you, Don. So this is just a holder to support the blade, but you loosen it up with the the knob on the side. That is correct. Let's look at some of the guidelines for setting blade height. Uh, Don mentioned that the longer you have the blade exposed between the part and the blade guide, the less rigid the blade is. Um, so in most cases you're going to want to try to bring that blade guide down um, so that this is not a really long distance. He said that the maximum distance between part and blade guide should be four times the thickness of the part. Uh, so you can bring this blade guide down uh, lower than this, but if you're using a pusher, uh, you're going to have to think about the clearance for the pusher. But the general rule of thumb is uh, the shorter you're exposing this blade, the more rigid it is, and the less uh, chance there is going to be that something's going to get in here that shouldn't be and get caught. Um, but in, uh, consult with your instructor to ask uh, her or him uh, what's the best for your particular situation. Now to actually set the blade height there's two controls you gotta look at. So first thing is there on the left side now you're obviously gonna just be doing this setting of the blade height while this machine is off. You're never to put your hands into this zone of danger down here uh, while the machine is on and that blade is running. This is while the machine is off. So you would first uh, use your left hand and support the blade. Then with your right hand, you'd use the, the blade guide tightening handle. So you could loosen that up. That would then allow this yellow part to move up and down. Once you move it to the correct height, uh, then you would tighten this back up and it would uh, keep the, the, the blade guide in the, the current position. Okay, Don's going to show us how to actually do some cutting next, so pay attention. It's kind of interesting. All right, um, so we've set the height properly. Uh, I noticed this piece of wood, Don, is this just something that you, is this like your blanket, you know, just a security my piece of wood? It's my pacifier, yes. I don't go anywhere without it. I got a little V-notch cut in here. I got some other little notches cut in there. Um, basically, you can tell it's well used, um, and it's there to protect you, the operator, and uh, it also helps support the work, all right? We call this our little pusher, all right? You got clearance so you can see down in your part, and it also helped me guide my part. If I get up here, you do not want to guide your part like this. Where's my thumb? It's right in line with this blade, all right? I'm short material. It's not like I have material way over here. I got my material here, so I'm sitting here like this. If I happen to slip off, my hand's going up in here. And yes, I have seen those accidents. I've seen people take and slice their thumb right straight up because they weren't using a pusher uh, and their hand slid off. So these accidents do happen. There's just not something we talk about. Um, so you're going to use this pusher. It'll help you guide. Some guys say like they use the guide that goes in here. What happens is you have set on each side of this, on this, each side of this blade. Over time they wear out and the blade will cut one side heavier than the other and it'll want to turn it'll turn and it'll cut not a straight line for you. So then you have to rotate your part. And if you're using a saw guide over here, a part guide, it'll tend to bind, end up binding your blade. And you won't be able to file the line anyways. So I recommend grabbing a pusher, pushing your work, pushing your work through. Okay. okay. Um, so we, you should never see a student holding their part by hand. It should always be, they should be touching the pusher and not the part. That is correct. And one other advantage the pusher has is if we, and I'll show you as we get closer, Jason will take a look at it. But as I cut this down through here, I'm going to have a very narrow piece of material here and I'm going to have the slot that's the width of the blade. So as I get down here, if I'm pushing on either side of here, I'm going to cause a pinching action. So it would be like having a pair of shears, right? So the thinner I get here, the more this material can bend in, all right? So if this material can bend in, it can pinch my saw blade. As a result, binding my saw blade and that can cause me to break it. So if I'm using this pusher, I'm getting even pressure along that whole edge. So I'm not 
pushing the material inward so it won't bind on my saw blade. That's the type of trivia and, and information that only someone with your kind of experience would have. Thank you, Don. All right, very good. Um, are we ready to cut, or is there anything else? Okay, so now if you're going to turn it on, is it okay to have the, the material touching the blade? Um, no, you can have it away. Okay. All right, it, it wasn't touching, and I just I didn't know. All right, um, you're going to turn the power on. He's got... Okay, what? all right. Now, depending on the material you're using, sometimes you're going to want lubrication, all right? They got, this is like a wax, all right? You can take and take this wax and just stick it on your blade, and it's a lubrication wax. It goes in the blade and helps extend life, tool life. Um, it also helps stop galling. Aluminum being so soft, it will gall and pick up on your blade, and it'll plug up your blade. So you want to use some kind of uh, lubrication. So do you put that just on the side of the blade, that, that wax, or does it go right into the... Right into the teeth. So, right into the teeth. so I could take it and I can do it right up through the end like this and let it cut right in. Or I took it and I let it run right into the side. That's all I was doing. How long do you have to hold it in there for the belt to... Go all the way around. around. I just watch until I can see the wax come back around. Then Probably I shouldn't take too long because it's 89 feet per minute. Right. So there's not 89 feet, so you're not waiting a whole minute. All right, so Don has done that. Uh, it looks like he is setting the part. You're cutting on the left side of the line because he wants to have extra material. Um, you're giving just a, a moderate amount of pressure, Don. You see my thumbs, I'm just pressing. I'm not putting a lot of weight into it. So I'm kind of relaxed sitting here. And you notice, take a look at the part. For me to stay on the line, for me to stay on that line, the part is no longer perpendicular to the blade. I'm actually turning the part to stay on the line. So that's showing you that the set's cutting differently. The blade's not cutting straight. So yeah, that's that's unusual. It seems like uh, it's not even it's not perpendicular all the time. No, it's not. It's going to vary as you go across your work. So you're basically steering your part through. All right, so here's an example. As I get thinner, if I was just pushing here and here, I could take and I could squeeze this together and it would pinch my blade. This is where the, example, the benefit of having this pusher, I can push right up into here. And there, it stops. If my fingers were there, I stand a chance that that sudden jolt, my fingers would end up in, in that blade. Now, you shouldn't be grabbing your part while that blade is on. Is that that's correct? That's correct. Right. So I'm going to shut that off and bring my part around. Now, there's lots of those burrs again. Yep, here we got a lot of burrs, and we'll go in the other room, and I'll show you how to deburr, or we can use a file to deburr. Now, this is, would this be called a rough cut, Don? That would be a rough cut. Because I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, gee, uh, <laughs> there's no way that's a straight line. It, it's... It's very difficult, if not impossible, to get a straight cut with this. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. You, you really have to pay a close attention. And a student should not expect to cut something two dimension with this. With this all, correct. All right. So you would then put this in the mill and probably mill that surface down so that it's perfect. perfect. That's correct. Okay. Yep. All right. You know, cutting rectangular stocks seems easy. Just turn the machine on and push it through. But there's more to it than that, as you saw. First off, you should use your uh, Sharpie marker or permanent marker, whatever kind you have, and draw and lay out your line that you want to be cutting along. Now remember, put this about an eighth inch long to allow for milling to the final dimension later on. You're never going to be able to cut a, uh, a, a precise line to the actual dimension you're going to need in your final part. You're going to have the blade turned on, don't have your part engaged, um, and you're going to use the wax stick uh, that's located near the side of the machine, and you're going to make sure that uh, all the teeth on the blade have been properly waxed. This wax uh, acts as a lubricant, so it'll cut uh, better. 
As you feed your part in, then this is the most important thing, you're to use a wooden pusher. You are never to use your bare hands uh, on your stock pushing it forward. Don showed in several occasions what could happen, how um, you know your fingers could get severed and cut very badly uh, if you're holding the part uh, by hand. The other thing that the pusher does is it provides an even pressure across all surfaces in the part. Don mentioned that as you're getting toward the end of the cut, if you have uneven pressure, the uh, the curve for what's you know the 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 slot that the the blade has left in the part could close up and actually bind the saw and break it. Obviously, the most important thing with the wooden pusher it keeps your hands away from the blade especially when the part gets cut through at the end there's a tendency to all of a sudden jump forward because you're putting a lot of pressure that pressure is being resisted by the part and then once the part gives way and is cut through your your hand and, and whatever is there is going to lunge forward a little bit that's why you need to have the pusher there before you collect your part you need to turn off the blade and make sure that uh, it's completely stationary. Also you might want to do what Don did and use the pusher to just push the part away from the blade even when it's off. Remember anytime you perform a cut you're going to create sharp edges known as burrs on the side of a part. So first thing you should do after you take a part out is you should file those down to take the burrs out. If you need to do any further smoothing you'd be using a belt sander. And once again, please be considerate of other students. So if you have a piece of stock that you're not using, the remaining stock, don't just put it back on the rack with sharp edges on it. Deburr that as well. Next up, we're going to see how Don uh, accommodates a cylindrical piece of material, which is sometimes also known as round stock. Uh, do you want to do any t other types of cuts, or are we just going to do cleanup? show you how to cut a piece of round stock in the bandsaw as well. Um, a lot of times students, uh, I've seen students come up and they're going to grab their material and they just want to cut the stock off and what will happen is, as you can see, we got the same binding situation is going to happen because now I got this kind of leverage on either side and students tend to think that they're pretty strong and they can hold this material. Well what will happen is you have this blade cutting in the downward motion, it will actually turn the stock. And if you're up here like this and you're pushing it thinking nothing's going to happen, this can rotate. Once it starts to rotate, it'll suck your finger in. Now you're, you can get your fingers underneath and pinch. Once it starts to pinch and it's pulling, as you can see, is it rolling up on my fingers and this thing's pulling down, I can have a severe pinch on my hands. All right? So well, there's just no good scenarios with pushing something by your own hand, is it, Don? No, there absolutely isn't. So what we're going to do is we use a vise. I'm going to take this vise and open up this vise so that I can fit over top of, over top of the material. All right. Now, you notice in which fashion I'm using this vise? It's not on its bottom like this, because if I use it in the bottom like this, when I go to saw, it's going to want to tip the part. All right. So I'm leaving the part on the table. The saw blade's pulling the material into the table. I'm going to take the vise, flip it upside down. All I'm trying to do with the vise is stop rotation. All right, I'm trying to stop rotation. I'm not using it to guide the part. So if I wanted to cut off an inch of material, I just got this sitting here. I grab my trusty scale, measure this out to about an inch, plus uh, 16th or eighth, whatever material you need left. I can turn on my, my saw blade, bring this back away. I'm using my pusher again, and now I can push the saw through the blade material through. And you notice my part's not spinning. All right? Do we only have to push it with that hand there? Because you don't have to push over on the right side? No, I don't need to push over on the right side. I can push like this. I can push like this. All right? I can use that to steer if I want. Okay. All right? Any questions? No, let's, uh, let's cut it right through, Don. All right. Now you started out with less pressure when you're at the tangent, but now that you're fully engaged in the part, you can push a little harder. That's correct. 
I see chips flying, so once again, having your safety glasses on, very, very important. Those are tiny, very fine chips. That would be a, that'd be a tough time getting that out of your eye. That would be bad to get out of your eye. They get up there and they get wedged in there. All right, notice that, and he's not going to go put his hand in there until the blade is stopped. He's us actually using the pusher. That's a good idea. So remember, each of these machines have a zone of danger, and your hand is to never incur into that zone. All right, Diane, what are you showing us here? Showing you the burr that's on this part. So if you pick it up and you try to rub your hand around it, you're going to stand a chance of cutting your fingers or getting uh, burrs in your hand. All right, you've got these sharp edges. All right, so you got to beware. Whenever you cut material, you're going to have sharp edges. You're going to want to deburr them. Everything is just don't go over to this being a round part. You're thinking lathe. You want to go over to lathe. You can't get it in a collet because there's burrs on it. So you have to think about deburring. Okay. All right, and the deburring process on this would probably be with either a belt sander or a file. Right. All right, and we'll show you that at a later time. Now, Don, while, now that we have our cuts done, just leave it. The next guy will be okay with that. Tooling machine guys would really appreciate you to leave the bandsaw like this. All right. Um, obviously, we're going to take our part out of this uh, this vise. We're going to put the the ch get the chips off of there. And is there any wiping down? Yes, we're going to take and wipe off the chips. We can sweep them uh, into a dustpan, or we can uh, sweep them onto the floor and then sweep them up later. So just remember, folks, the job's not done until the cleanup is finished. Once again, John Waddick here giving you life lessons. For some of you that who, might, who may one day become married, your wife or her husband is going to want the same thing. You make a mess around the house, you leave your underwear around, they're going to want you to pick it up. Let's look at the principles of what you should do for cutting cylindrical stock. First off, you're going to draw a cut line using your permanent marker. And as with the rectangular stock, you want to make that about an eighth inch long to allow for further milling or, in most cases, probably on a cylindrical piece, facing off on the lathe. Once again, you're going to lubricate the blade with the wax stick. You're going to use an upside down vise to hold the part. Now, while you're putting the part in the vise, uh, you do not want to have the, the blade going. Now, the upside down vise, what it's used to do is to prevent rotation of the part. Now, because of the three tooth rule, three teeth rule, I guess it's, it is, you need to use a slow feed rate at the start of the cut because as the blade comes in to the tangency of the cylindrical part, only one tooth is going to be engaged at any given time. So while that's happening, you need to be going very slowly. Once the part is engaged fully into the cut, um, then you're, you're fine. You can, you can increase the feed rate. You're also going to use the wooden pusher. Even though you have the part in an upside down vise, uh, you're going to use the wooden pusher. You're never going to push a part with, with your hand. You need to turn off the blade, make sure it's completely stationary, and then you can collect your part. And once again, even with cylindrical parts, uh, there's going to be burrs, so you need to deburr those uh, on your part and the remaining stock. Let's look at the questions that you're going to hand in to your lab instructor. First question. List three items other than the blade that an engineering student should never touch on the vertical bandsaw. Second. Draw and label a diagram of the control panel. What must be done to disengage the e-stop so that the button pops out? Three, if the part being cut is half inch thick or half inch high, I should say, what is the maximum safe distance between the top of the part and the bottom of the saw blade guide? Describe how this distance can be adjusted on the vertical bandsaw. 4 says, list the procedures for cutting rectangular stock on the vertical bandsaw. And the last question, why should cylindrical stock be held with a vise when cutting it in a vertical bandsaw? And to that, you need to also uh, answer, 
in what orientation should the vice be used. Thanks for coming to this movie. We have one more in store 